and best approach to neck training for grappling athletes best approach and like the safest approach is to start with some isometric work in my opinion the best way to start isometric work is start on like your strongest muscle groups first just to get used to it usually the posterior of the neck so what essentially ends up being the tops of your traps um, are probably the most used to training and you should start there so put like a very thin pillow on the floor lie down flat with the back of your head on the pillow and you can just press into the pillow and just hold that isometrically start off with 15 to 20 seconds do multiple holds for maybe three days a week for a number of weeks you can do the exact same on the side and on the front just start with those be able to hold the contraction for a long time before you go into any sort of rep work um, but to be honest, people get very, 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 very good, thick, strong necks from a lot of isometric work without ever needing to go to dynamic neck work. The, the issue, sorry, the issue with dynamic neck work and why I wouldn't be getting you to go there immediately is because most grappling or contact sports athletes probably have pre-existing issues with their neck or shoulders and any sort of additional, like my neck is shagged now and I haven't played ball in seven years. Joke, so like <laughs> play ball like playing ball i think um after that so once you've kind of gotten fairly adept at the any kind of neck training if you haven't done it yet i would say you know progressing to something that is very objectively loadable after that so something that is without a shadow of doubt what it is you're loading so don't go from doing those isometrics that fitz mentioned to doing headstands and rocking on your head or doing those neck rolls where you lie the thing you see mike tyson doing where he's rolling around like this oh. No. so neck training you know train it to a full range of motion so those neck pads you see and these machines i think they're a great apparatus for neck training because neck training obviously is something you want to be very very diligent with and very careful with so if you're going to do it definitely get one of those some apparatus that you can load very very specifically then you lie on the bench and you go forward and backwards or side to side i think there's nothing wrong with that once you've gotten a certain level of proficiency and then you can start loading that up very very appropriately so you can start loading it you know one kilos and then you know it's two and a half kilos you know and there's no no issue with that you know so you want to be able to fully in control of your neck training um because there is nothing you want to fuck up less than your neck no nope. fucking and somebody who's fucked up their neck um that all you fucked up huh? huh huh thomas wright says how do i develop ankle stiffness one foot starts flopping around at, on runs after a kilometer or so I wonder if it is right leg. Answer the question, will you, for fuck's sake. Um, so there's man. two things, Thomas, right? Ankle stiffness, as you kind of rightly probably pointed out at this point, is, is one of the most important things in running pace. What you need to look at is fatigue is an issue with this, and then there's actual structural integrity of the ankle is, is an issue as well. In the case of fatigue, you need to do more capacity runs, right? So if you're running kilometers at a five minute per kilometer pace and that's what you run like your five to ten k's at or three to five k's at what you need to do is you need to start doing uh, capacity running at a significantly faster pace so you might do um you might do eight 500 meter runs at a four minute per kilometer pace and you keep going at those capacity runs to try and induce that same level of fatigue right so you need to go above pace if i assume you're training for like a 5k say for example the second thing is the actual structural integrity of the ankle because of the thickness and the just hardiness of your achilles tendon it's quite difficult to gain any sort of structural tissue there so you might need to start like thinking about lengthening it out are you taking the stirrer off me yeah you might need to start thinking about lengthening out your Achilles. So doing things like very, very slow and controlled tempo calf raises and um, any sort of like, like a sissy squat where you're coming up on your heels at the end, but very, very slow and controlled. Um, but I would go to the capacity runs first, focusing on really good technique at above race pace, and then bring that onto the road after a, a few months and see how you get on. Um, good question. Great question. So Chris Dance says, push jerk is a main lift catching high with a narrow grip for more upper body engagement for sports. Uh, the answer is no, but maybe, right? So I would say, first of all, look at what you're trying to get out of, of stuff like overhead work for athletes for, or upper body stuff. So maybe if you're some kind of thrower, discus, hammer, whatever, you definitely get some benefit from doing stuff like push jerks. 
most people, right, and, and I'd see why you might want to do a push jerk instead of a split jerk. What I would probably do is behind the neck jerks if I was going to do it with an athlete, unless that athlete was particularly talented. Uh, so most people are very, very poor at the jerk in general, even if they're just doing weightlifting. Even if they're talented athletes initially, it takes a long time for them to learn how to do the jerk and push jerk in general or split jerk. So you would get the benefits from, I think, from a behind the neck jerk. It's usually much, much easier. You can go much faster, which realistically is probably what you're looking for from a jerk for an athlete. It's just speed production, power production. So you can go a lot faster. You can get that change of speed, which is very, very useful from the jerk as well. So extending and contracting. So some people would make the argument that most sports, the most important thing is how fast can an athlete relax his muscle tissue and then re-engage it again. And so stuff like split jerks in particular or behind the neck jerks teach you that very, very well if you can do them correctly. So I'd probably do behind the neck jerks, um, but for probably a split jerk, but a power jerk would do okay from behind the neck as well, I would think. What do you think fits? Yeah, I think power jerk from behind the neck with a slightly wider than normal grip is great. Yeah, I wouldn't be going with the narrow grip for more upper no. body because you don't really get more upper body from it, to be honest. It'll just make the lift more difficult and you'll get less out of it because unlikely most athletes are pretty tight overhead as they're not used to doing that range of motion. So I would say be looking at behind the neck kind of somewhere on the back squat grip, so like slightly wider than shoulder grip probably out here or even a little bit wider would probably be something you're better off doing. Okay, how to strengthen an IT band? Uh, getting pain above the knee on the side when squatting three four days now so it band runs like if this was my quad this was my quad it band runs laterally around along the outside um it band issues are there's a number of things that come into play we don't answer injury questions as a rule here right but i'm gonna point to the it band and just talk about one or two things People oftentimes when squatting really favor their lateral side of their quads. So they'll have knees out the side, they'll have hips turned back and they'll have something akin to a low bar squat style with high bar bar positions. This really does put the most of the emphasis laterally on our legs. So both anteriorly and posteriorly, your quads and your hamstrings develop laterally much quicker than they do medially. So you're left with an underdeveloped VMO probably an underdeveloped um, rec fem as well because of that, but you need to start thinking about altering your squat stance. So as you're not just loading everything onto your vas lateralis, those big chunks on the outside of your legs, I think that will make a big difference. Um, Test your IT band for shortness. I can't think of the name of the test, but test your IT band for shortness and see do you have like excessive shortness on one side or tightness on one side and um, and just see how that is but that's about as far into the injury stuff as we'll go i would say as well if, if it's causing issue now usually your body is great at like telling you if something is going to happen much worse down the line so get on top of this now and try to figure out what it is because i can guarantee you in six months to two years time it's going to be a much worse injury and you're going to regret yeah. not paying attention to it at the moment god knows I'm oh sorry. i know what the injury will be yeah, got just have ten it. What are your opinions on steroid use for people not competing? Work away. Yeah, but if no, no real strong opinion on either way. It's up to people to educate yourself on the the whole subject and then decide if that is something you want to do. Um, yeah, I don't really have a strong opinion for or against it. I think. Um, Clarence kind of got up in arms about educating recreational users, and I think that is definitely something that is worthwhile, definitely very important for more research. Yeah. Some um, people make the argument that, and I def, I would, that's a definitely a true argument, is very, very likely. If they hadn't been demonized like they were, there'd be much, 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 much safer compounds here at the moment in, on, on planet Earth. Yeah. Which I think is uh, a funny thing. So the, the irony of... Um, of demonizing them yeah has actually made it them unsafer or kept them unsafe whereas if they weren't demonized they would be in a position to have safer compounds developed so obviously there's people they do studies on the ones that are currently in use and they're these are the effects of those you know the side effects or whatever but people just keep rehashing the same stuff you know but it's like developing new ones that people could use would be the real thing because yeah. people are going to use them anyway you know it's it's Why? inevitable yeah. My whole issue on this topic is it's not it's not our right to have any opinion over what other people decide to do for themselves. 
Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. If you're not competing, you're not doing it, like, no matter who you are, you, you shouldn't really have an opinion over, or, like, your opinion doesn't mean anything over what anyone else does. Like, if you want to wear a yellow t-shirt, wear a yellow t-shirt. Um, it would be very interesting to see what is in, what would be there now. So I think Project said to us on one of the podcasts that the last anabolic steroid developed yeah. was something in the 19, 1982 range, I think, the early 1980s. So that, in terms of like pharmaceutical development, my God, that is literally a different it's like it's like going from this the wood the stone age to the fucking the age we're now like it's yeah such a development you know there is like just not even comparable how different there would be and how much safer they probably would be now and how much more effective some people try to make the argument that SARMs are a development of that and i think SARMs aren't really in reality what that is you know SARMs are a divergent path i think in a slightly wrong direction do you hear what? Is that outside? Outside, yeah. Um, okay. Just say a little prayer. Get your money, man. Like those on. I'm hopeful. Yes, I am hopeful for today. Take this.